now. So I uh, leave the field open for Dr. Sonal and Dr. Sheila and Dr. Isabella, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Meher. So uh, should I begin with the introduction to Honet? Yes, please. Uh, Meher, have you enabled we'll shares? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask the question answers will come later, so we can start. And uh, what I will suggest, Meher, is that for the question and answer session, uh, we will, um, let's have everybody's camera on and we can take photographs to post on the WOW website that the activity that we did today is also a part of the Antimicrobial Awareness Week. If it's Why? okay with everybody. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, you've started sharing your screen, so I'm sure it will be visible shortly. Is my screen visible now? Because it's showing here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So uh, the objective of these three days is basically to have an overview on antimicrobial resistance and to impart the knowledge and skills which are required for WhoNet, which is used for, an, uh, for collection of AMR surveillance data across the world, and to share uh, the user experience and the lessons that we've learned. Uh, as we keep on using it, it's just like a WhatsApp app. The more you use it, the more you come to know about its features. Uh, we never knew what a Google Classroom is till we all went online. So there are many, many things which, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a user to develop uh, com being comfortable with on the same ground. But basically what is actually Hoonet is that it's a, it's a software which is used and I'm going to talk about the brief overview of what all it can do and what all it helps with. So it's a free software which was developed by the WHO Collaborating Center for Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance in Boston. And the goal is basically to enhance the local use of laboratory data and to promote national and international collaboration through exchange of data. These, you can use it in your own laboratory. You can use it for national or international surveillance network. Right now, uh, I am part of the two networks, the AMR National Surveillance Network in the country, where we share this data using the WhoNet platform. And the other is the WHO IAMM network for Delhi, for which I am the coordinator and we collect the data from 24 laboratories which are associated in our network and collate and analyze and in order to create a Delhi antibiograms. Uh, the software here is available in multiple languages, but it's not available in Hindi as yet. It's available in English, French, Spanish, and so many others. And it not only works for human health, it also is very, uh, you know, works very well for uh, veterinary or animal or agriculture and so on and so forth. So all these things going on side by side, but basically it facilitates the uh, local epidemiology and selection of agents and identification of hospital and community outbreaks and hope that all of you have uh, downloaded this HUNET software so that you can work with me uh, accordingly. So uh, what are the components in HUNET? Now HUNET is a kind of a system, it's a software where you are going to create your own um, laboratory. Just like you create your laboratory physically, Similarly, you will create a laboratory, which is a virtual laboratory on your computer. Now that laboratory, please remember, will pick up, there is no artificial intelligence in the software. So it will pick up only what you instruct it to do. If you tell it to pick up the data of vancomycin resistant enterococci, then you have to create a field for vancomycin in its laboratory configuration. So it actually customizes your data as per your need also. If you have two ICUs, there is a prop, uh, you know, proposal to make two ICUs in the lab. If you have five ICUs, you can make five ICUs. If you don't have OPDs, no problem. The UNED will be, can be configured to only inpatient data. So you can use it accordingly, the data fields, whether you want to keep the hospital ID number, whether you want to keep the Aadhaar number, the social security number, Whatever you want to trap in that system, 
you have to create it in your laboratory configurations. The second part is the data entry and clinical reporting. Now, the first thing is, it's a very versatile tool. So it allows you to have a routine entry of susceptibility results, and it allows you to retrieve them, correct them, and print them in clinical records. Now, using this data entry, it also provides an immediate feedback. It gives you an alert that this, this is a pan-drug resistant organism, or this is a multi-drug resistant organism. Do you think it's not a laboratory error and you still want to save it? Now that alert, when it pops up, uh, I'll be showing you these alert photographs in between. When this kind of alerts pop up, you know that this is, uh, you know, something has gone wrong in my laboratory. Maybe I want to trace this patient for isolation, or maybe I want to reconfirm this isolate. Suppose you get VRSA, you would like to reconfirm that isolate, cholestine resistant uh, enterobacteriaceae. So the, then the other is that you can also use it or customize it to clinical reporting. When we were started our COVID laboratory, it was extremely difficult for us to dispatch the reports and we did not have a lab information system. So what we did was that uh, the ICMR portal, which was created to capture all the data for uh, COVID-19 testing, we used to download an Excel at the end of the day and that Excel would then be converted by uh, Hunet into a Hunet folder and a report generating forum so that the reports would be generated in minutes, which would otherwise take a lot of time, uh, you know, making them manually or making them in an electronic medium. And then those PDFs, we could directly mail to our clinicians or send them on WhatsApp groups, which is between one and one so that they don't get leaked out to any other public. So we had made specific mailing groups in order to send these to say surgery or to medicine or to ICUs and so on and so forth. So we used at that time to create this. And this is something which, how it looks like when you create a, a database from the system. So you, can, you, you have a laboratory name, you have identification name, you have age, sex, date of admission, location, whether they are pediatric, whether they are surgery, whether they are OBS gynae, what is the sample collection date? What is the specimen type which is there? And what is the organism which is available? So all these, this is Acinetobacter, for example. So all this information is available to this. Continuing from that, then you have, what is it sensitive to? What is it resistant to? These are the zone diameters which are entered from the manual Kirby Boyer testing. This is about the manual uh, who net entries that we are doing from Kirby Boyer. If you have a white tech or an automated system like Microscan or white tech or Beckman Coulter, then you need to have a different proposition which Isabella is going to talk about as to how to convert those Excels or those lab information systems directly into such kind of files. They will directly do it for you. You don't have to do each and every entry manually. So moving further, what are the alerts now? Data and it also, the third thing that it can do is permit a data analysis. And the data analysis can be in multiple ways. It can create a line list. Suppose you want to find out how many MRSs are there from our ICUs, it creates a line list for you. It gives you summary and frequencies over time that, okay, in the month of November, my lab got 15 MDROs, five via visa or two VRE, something like that. That also you can be done. Then you can create a lot and play a lot with the AST statistics. You want to see congruence between two. You want to see the antibiogram and create an antibiogram for your infection control and antibiotic stewardship activities. If you want to see the zone, di the zone diameters can give you an idea if tomorrow the guideline changes. That from 20, it has been now reduced to 15. You can see how much have you actually over-reported or under-reported before this if you enter the zone diameters. Then it also creates your MIC histogram and tells you that whether the MIC is rising slowly or coming down to a particular drug. These scatter plots basically are very interesting and I'll show you how they work. The regression curves, which otherwise are a nightmare to do in Excel and um, SPSS, unless you are a very good statistician and not a doctor. Then antibiotic resistant profile listings. Suppose I want to find out from Somebody calls me from the ICU and says, we want to make our antibiotic policy. Can you tell us the past two years profile, resistance profile data? And in, a, in minutes, you can do that. Then obviously the alert feature. 
you can find out whether a particular hospital or a community outbreak of bacterial or non bacterial so that the, these kind of advantages are there and uh, sometimes people feel that it's a little cumbersome to work with but as you go on working you keep on learning more so this is something a data analysis would look like that see if if i look at uh, my data for a particular uh, time period then it shows 836 isolates which are uh, classified into icu in patients and out patients and these are the number of isolates these are the percentages of the isolates this is from the number of patients so you you also have an option to make it from one from one patient then what did i get in january what did i get in february it also gives you a monthly similarly for cleb and all this this is just a snapshot which is there and it also tells you as to what how this is moving further then i want to find out what are the various mrsas which are available to us from various sites so if you take this as the break point sensitivity is more than 22 then i find that okay uh, from derma opd interestingly i've got a lot of mrss and i have also got a lot of from obzen gyni and i also have a few from medicine and a large number is from pediatrics so this is how the whole thing can go on and it also gives you a lot of this 95% ci also tells you what is the variation of this data where is where do these uh, data actually lie and you can also make out this kind of anti biogram that i can see that the suppoxetin uh, fox is suffoxetin suppoxetin resistance is highest where uh, say icu as uh, expected and also in neonatology and also in obs gyni and some amount in orthopedics then uh, if we do want to do an ast analysis of this mrs suppose we want to find out that this mrs is sensitive actually to what that is what the antibiotic policy will be made on and we will we will find that there is uh, a lot of sensitivity to linozolid there is some amount of sensitivity to gentamicin and you can also pick up here that by mistake somebody has put in genta high level also and here i can catch hold of the person who's done the entry and immediately pick it up and then there are the various antibiotic profiles that get picked up what are the various antibiotic profiles that okay i have some erythromycin resistance as for i have erythro and cipro combined as this and i have penicillin and erythro in 22% of the isolates so this is what it helps me to find out whether we are having mdros or whether we are having resistant profiles and then you can also find out the monthly flow of this kind of resistance profile now this i said scatter plots are an interesting thing i want to see whatever is genta sensitive is it also mycosin sensitive very often we say that these two are complementary antibiotics and should we put up one or uh, say we have resource constraints and we want to put up only one of these so how do we go about that so that is uh, possible when we are trying to create a scatter plot now this scatter plot clearly tells tells you what is gentamicin resistance and what is mycosin resistance is only 3% but what is gentamicin resistance is actually sensitive to mycosin in 10% of the cases and what is sensitive to uh, genta is also sensitive to omica in 85% of the cases so it tells you that even if you use one of these drugs if you have uh, any resource constraints it should work very well similarly you can create for other antibiotics as well so this is another alert table which you can find out and you see that at the end of the month what are the various alerts that i got i got a few there i got a few quality control alerts and i got a few important species alert because i got listeria one listeria i got one salmonella and i also got an important resistant alert which said that it's possibly an esbl producing enterobacteriaceae possibly an enterobacteriaceae which is non susceptible to mycosin or uh, this was very interesting i have a publication on ceftriax on resistant salmonella which we picked up on a routine uh, monitoring of our data from hunet the other part of hunet is a backlink so when you download hunet the backlink comes on separately you know it's a little egocentrical because it's a little dealing with the automation so it's got a little ego with it so it comes separately from hunet and you will see two icons on your desktop one will be hunet and the other will be backlink so why why this helps is that as this hunet was developed over the years i have been using hunet for past 20 years and 
in between came backlink suddenly because people started using laboratory information systems people started using microsoft excel access epi info then automated systems came like white tech microscan sensitizer and then came the in house information systems uh, the portals the various web portals which were developed and the various uh, systems that were developed uh, so all these had to be integrated with hunet and backlink was to provide a link through the back door to have these excels or these systems converted into a hunet platform because it's very very difficult for any lab to incorporate a manual hunet and then enter those vitec results uh, manually because uh, the automated system are going to do so many antibiotics together so it, it it really streamlines the work and you can also create these models for other things so it's primarily for clinical reporting for billing for day to day specimen processing and most systems have very limited capacities you know sometimes the company people come and tell you don't use hunet sir use our system for example vitec has myla i don't know about sensitizer or any other and i just uh, brush them off so they don't come to me any more now for the past 7 8 years because they know that i am not going to get swayed away by this what happens is one your data privacy goes when you use their systems this is your own system in your own computer you are responsible for data that is a company software everything is going on cloud you don't know where it will be used tomorrow secondly it is this is very very simple to use compared to that and the the rest of the entries can also be done in that in the other commercially available systems it becomes really difficult for you to enter something manually suppose you do colistin with agar dilution or broad micro dilution which is the recommended norm and you want to enter that result in hunet you can do that but in the commercially available system they will not allow that the other problem is that they give you they don't give you the true mics they give you uh when you collect the data and you convert the file you will see that it totally tells you it is more than this less than that it doesn't give you the true mics majority of these automated platforms so you can't compare your data with something you know if i want want to say that this is the uh, system then i'm not now uh, it is compatible with any windows server after 2008 and it is compatible it's not it just allows an additional you need 2 gbs for data storage maximally a uh, ram should be a minimum of 1024 so this is cpu should be minimum pentium 4 and it's got two versions 32 bit as well as 64 bit the only problem with hunet is that it doesn't work on mac and that for people like me becomes an extremely limiting issue because i although i have a desktop of dell at work i don't have anything at home so if anybody wants a clarification i literally have to wait till the next day where i can actually open my uh, you know computer and see as to what's uh, you know there in hunet so how do you install this installation is very very simple this is an older slide so you see hunet 2018 here but now 2020 and 2021 are an excellent things and they have taken care of earlier hunet used to crash a lot now they have made sure that the system is better with the squilight addition then you also have a hunet web which uh, i don't particularly encourage to use because it's again a cloud based system and the old user friendly 5.6 if you want to teach somebody right from scratch the hunet 5.6 is the best thing to teach but the hunet new one 2020 and 2021 are very extremely uh, user friendly and this is how you just uh, click on the website it tells you to run the diagnos setup agree to the license just like any other software and then you run it and keep clicking next 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 and it works so uh, you might be asked to reboot the computer to complete the installation which you can anyway do if you want to copy from a usb you can copy the hunet folder and put it in your usb drive and double click on the folder it will again start the application drive so you can even use it from another person suppose you want to take this desktop to your uh, home pc or home laptop that also can be done the same file with the same lab configuration can be done so after you run it you uh, will get a start menu and you launch it and these are the icons that you will see that's what i said the hunet now comes with a backlink icon so you have a hunet icon and you have a backlink 
icon. Both these icons will be made on your desktops and you will know that, uh, okay, now I'm ready. And they will also be there in your pop-up where they will tell you that they are uh, there for you to use it. As you can see, my system is full of uh, backlink and AMC tools and, and these things. So how do you run when you, um, are we, are we ready to begin? Is everybody on with their uh, laptop or uh, with the Hoonet downloaded and the Hoonet, just double click on the Hoonet icon and this will open for you. So I'll just give you a minute. If you are not on, you can do that and we can take you through straight to laboratory configuration. So those of you who are opening, you will see a few things here. There will be a glass uh, hospital. There will be a Hunet test hospital. And uh, you, will, you will see two or three things here. Uh, mine is an older version. These photographs are very old. So uh, you only see the WHO test hospital here. And you click on the new laboratory. When you click on the new laboratory, it will take you to another page, which will open which will ask you to choose the language. By default, Hunet begins in English. But if you want in any of these languages also, it's available to you. As I've written, two or three more languages have been added in 2021. So you can pick up these languages also if you want. So this is how you select the language if you want it to be, and you okay it. I feel uh, majority of people are uh, you know, okay with this. So let's, uh, we'll continue with this. And uh, all right, now uh, we, I, I will go to lab configurations straight uh, forward because that is the continuation of this. So we'll go straight to the laboratory configurations. Can you see my screen? Let's just see if everybody is with Dr. Sonal. Is my screen visible? Screen is not visible to me. Is it visible to others? Screen is not visible. Okay. Okay, is it visible now? Yes. I think it's visible now? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, is everybody on board? I've had a few yes in the system. So I think we'll begin now. So uh, we click on the new laboratory. Once uh, you click on the new laboratory, what actually happens is that something like this opens. Now, <clears throat> is everybody okay with it? Yes, it's fine. Yeah, so uh, there are four things that you can see. One is uh, the, because this is, this system is only showing you the WHO test hospital. You can, first thing you have to do is put in your own country here. So wherever you are, you put in your own country, change this WHO to uh, your country that is there by the drop down menu. And then you create the laboratory name. For example, if it is Molana Azad Medical College, I would write Molana Azad Medical College here and then make a short name. So for MAMSI, the short name of the laboratory code is MAM. So Molana Azad Medical College becomes MAM. So similarly, if you have say SR, SRM, then you make it as SRM. If you have uh, Amrita Institute, then you make it as AIM. So you make it here and then because most of us are, I think all of us are dealing with clinical samples and working with human isolates, 
we keep this as human because what happens is this for certain drugs and for certain drug bug combinations the breakpoints are different when it comes to animals so we currently if you are working with a food laboratory or an animal laboratory then maybe you can click this but otherwise keep it to human if you are working with all the types of isolate then my advice to you is to create two laboratories one for the human and the other for human animal food or environment if you are working with multiple uh, isolates some come from environment some come from uh, animals and some come the referral laboratories which are there then you can click human animal food and environment now then you see uh, there are four uh, drop boxes here or plug in points here one is antibiotics now antibiotic is a must field it's not an optional field because it's going to pick up the antibiotics that are used in your laboratory or your laboratory may have different antibiotics than mine third person may have different antibiotics so we need to and we may be using different breakpoints different uh, you know guidelines somebody may be using clsi somebody may be using ucast so then it becomes extremely important to click on the antibiotics accordingly locations why is it written optional is that certain laboratories for example uh, i don't know about uh, your uh, country mayor but in india we have these uh, laboratories which are chain laboratories you know which which have collection centers and have laboratories in every city and in multiple locations in the city itself there are large laboratories there metropolis is there multiple thyro care multiple laboratories are there now they are online also so there the location they don't need to have a location field there because they all their clients are majority either they are direct to consumer or they are dtc or they are a walk in client so they may not locate but if you have a tertiary care hospital then you might want to know what goes on in pediatrics what is the icu pattern what is an inpatient pattern what is an opd pattern you may sometimes have two or three different institutions also attached with you you might have a children hospital you might have an adult hospital you might have a psychiatric unit attached to you so you you might have a primary health center which is associated with your college so all these you have to make your locations here then again data fields what all data fields you want to include the file that i showed you had age had sex date of admission date of sample specimen collection so what what data fields you want to collect that also you have to make on your own alerts you don't have to do much unless and until you want to define a particular alert the alert library if you go and see it's got already got huge number of alerts so you basically don't need much now what we will do is that we will go one by one to these fields and see how it works out so if you click on antibiotics what happens now if you if you click on antibiotics you will see a very interesting thing you will see that it will allow you to choose the antibiotics which you test in your laboratory it allows you to choose the guidelines which are there in your laboratory and it allows you to choose the antibiotic name so if you go here this is the hunet antibiotic list from here you pick up the guideline so if you might be having right now clsi 2021 in your system so you can pick up clsi 2021 and the testing method suppose you use disk suppose you use mic suppose you use e test now the problem here is that you might ask me that if it is disk i can't select mic if it is mic can't i select e test now you can do anything but the thing is that you'll have to pick it up from here and put it in your box now who net works in two windows one which is available to us and the other is the goodie bag that we create so on uh, my right hand side or on your right hand side of on the screen you will see a window which is empty right now so whatever you select from the left hand side window can be transported here in two ways one is you double click on this on any of the antibiotics you double click the moment you double click on say this five flow cytosine it will come to this window that means it's come in your laboratory configuration or other thing is that you select this and you push this arrow button when you push this arrow button this gets transferred to here i'm sorry i don't have hunet in my system and that is what is creating the problem here 
So we shift this antibiotic to this place. Now, if you look at it, it says Neo, it says UCAST, it says CLSI. So whenever you have chosen the height, your guidelines to be CLSI, stick to CLSI in these antibiotics as well. Do not shift to any other because otherwise your system will not work. As I said, it's like any other computer it doesn't have its own artificial intelligence. It's going to pick up what you put here. So you will put up, pick up something from CLSI here and put it here. The, if you choose the disk, then remember to pick up disk from here. If you scroll down the menu, you will also find there are a MIC things. So if you, let's go to this one. So if you pick up anything from here and you send it here, it will show you how many antibiotics have you picked up. So selecting your antibiotics will now have three things. One is your reference guideline, the testing method, and the antibiotic with the potency for diffusion testing or the MIC, which you want to check. It will give you an option for both. So for diffusion, remember to pick up, it will either say CLSI or it will say ND. ND was because priorly, earlier it used to be NCCLS with diffusion, and this used to be. I don't know what the new system says. Then e-test will show underscore and e that means for e-test for mic it will be vancomycin underscore n and m m means for mic so remember when you if you click disk diffusion up then you need to stick and pick up the disk diffusion disk but if you've clicked e-test then you need to pick up e-test this thing and if you pick up the if you Take the MIC uh, in this window here, then obviously you will pick up the MIC from this and you will transport it by either double clicking or by selecting. So can we all, the laboratory that you've opened, can we have this selection and be done with it? If, if you feel like you have two minutes, And I'll give you two minutes. If you can move a few antibiotics and see if any of you comes with a problem, then please let me know. Sorry. Can we move a few of these antibiotics? Okay, so is everyone able to do that? Are we okay with it? Can we move ahead? Yes, very well explained, Sona. I'm really enjoying it. Anybody has issues, please, uh, you could always say your problem. So should I move ahead, Mayor? Sorry. Yes, I think so. Okay, okay. So. Moving ahead. Now, when you look at the antibiotics, you have to configure them. The first thing they have done is that you, you put, uh, you know, a lot of people together, a lot of, uh, so I say, uh, I always like to call it a Santa goodie bag. So you put a lot of things in the Santa goodie bag. Now you need to gift wrap them to give it to the kids. So. Again, you have to again define these antibiotics in various terminologies. 
so if when you when you try to uh, gift wrap anything sometimes it is circular sometimes it is uh, uh, you know a gift is rectangular and accordingly you cut your gift paper so similarly we have to define these antibiotics so we define them in terms of the breakpoints that are there the panels that we are going to create because that's going to make our data entry very very easy and the resistant profiles that we are going to create so that we know tomorrow that if this resistant comes what action do we have to take so the correct uh, you know hunet is a very user friendly software so someone has asked me in the chat box how to add vanco screen agar i'll come back to that just leave it uh, right now it's not there in the antibiotics it is intentionally put in that list for you let me see how many of you are actually doing it so the it automatically sets up the correct official breakpoints according to the reference body but sometimes there are no official breakpoint for the antibiotics that you select or there might be a disagreement and you want to work with the older version or the newer version and this might be true if you're working with a particular pathogen or a particular drug bug combination for any particular research purposes so in those cases you might have to create your own and where you can click on these species specific uh, breakpoints and this is how it works so if you have these are the general breakpoints you know where it tells you what is resistance what is intermediate and what is sensitive and you can also compare these which are used in your so basically this table is trying to tell you that uh, if you have a, a say you know just a moment if you have uh, cls using a clsi disc of ampicillin for enterococcus this is the breakpoint that is there if you want to make any changes you want to add something you want to delete something you can do that and you click okay here also you say okay i am okay with the general breakpoints which are there in the system i am not going to change anything but if you want to do you have to select if you select any of these windows here it will select like this and it will show you something which is like this so here what happens is that in general breakpoint this is how the table looks like and in specific you will have a specific breakpoints which is visible to you so what is there in the general now general is that you just want to you can even take a print out of this and keep if you if you are in a teaching hospital and you want to use this information but it tells you very very well as to you know you want to keep it on the reporting seat also it's very good for you to do that now you look at it here it says nalidixic acid this this is the breakpoint and neutrophilin time this is the breakpoint so but what is so interesting here is that sometimes i want to uh, remember that this is this is the breakpoint which is as per the older version or the newer version this has now changed so that is why this is in circulate then we are continuing with the antibiotic configuration and remember the breakpoint the panels and the resistant profiles are all here so if you want to click on the breakpoints you will get what i was telling you panels will come to it in a while and profiles also i'll come so at any point of time you want to print this list the santa goody bag on the right uh, side then you can print it keep it in your file keep it in your lab paste it in your working bench so that nobody forgets so now if you click on the panels please everybody go on your panels and click it will show you all the antibiotics that you've selected in the rows and the list of the various organism groupings in the column so your laboratory now what it shows is that whatever panel you selected everything is available to you now you don't you will not put colistin for staphylococcus so why should it be there in that panel so for staphylococcus you create a panel say gentamicin cipro erythro trimethosulfa cefoxetin doxycycline clinda vanco screen agar and lenalidoxine for enterococcus again you have a particular panel for gram negatives you have a particular panel pseudomonas you can have a panel salmonella vibrio whatever you were picking up you can have a panel how this panel will help you is it will help you in creating a conditional antibiotic reporting so that you don't report anything which is not required for example you have an msa if you have an msa 
there is no need to report sensitivity to vancomycin or linezolid because it's a methicillin sensitive staph aureus. Similarly, if you have a gram negative isolate, which is sensitive to cephalosporins or sensitive to piperacillin tazobactam, you may want to withheld the sensitivity to carbapenems or cholestin because so as to have a conditional antibiotic reporting and also to have a, something which, you know, as a stewardship activity for the clinician to hold back on to. Because if you give, I have observed in my years of experience, if you give them the sensitivity of linozolid, they will give linozolid and they will not wait, uh, you know, whether the isolate, they will not look at it. If they are giving linozolid or vancomycin, they will not discontinue or de-escalate. But if you say MSSA and you don't give that sensitivity, then you say, oh, this is not given. Probably they have not done it. So what I will do is I will de-escalate. So that gives you some scope or some stewardship somewhere. I hope there are not too many clinicians in the uh, gathering. Otherwise, uh, my, uh, my warrant for death is already signed. So then uh, this another conditional reporting that you can do is that probably you don't want to report certain broad spectrum drugs in the first go then also you can have this. And it also helps you to generate your reports very well. So if, if you look at the conditional reporting, the first line antibiotics are this. That means for every staph aureus, my first line would be say cefoxidin, ciprofloxacin, clindamycin, doxycycline, erythro, gento, genta. And I can shift this linozolid to second line antibiotics. Linozolid here, vancomycin here. So that I will not report and I can issue an instruction that do not print sensitivity to linozolid or to vancomycin. Then there are print all second line antibiotics with the result of intermediate. That also it can do. That suppose all first line are resistant, then the second line will be automatically printed. So I don't have to use my brains to see that, okay, only for this, I make a change in my computer and print. It's, it's there. Then print all second line antibiotics if the isolate is resistant to multiple first line. Res then how many? Suppose it is resistant or intermediate to more than two or three or four, then I can give these instructions right in and there and the report can be printed. I can also set in some additional rules by clicking it here. This little drop that you see in gray, if I click on these, then this becomes active and I can make an additional rule also that suppose linozolid sensitivity is to be given only if there is a vancomycin intermediate resistant or vice versa or linozolid is to be printed only for oral or OPD patients because it's an oral drug. So this is how I can customize the unit to do reporting to give away the reports to the patients. Similarly for uh, you see this, in the gram-negative ones, I make first line as ampicillin, cefepime, cefotaxime, ciprofloxacin, nitrofurantoin, and trimethoprim. Ertapenem or a carbapenem here is made second line. I can also say do not print. This is only for my. And similarly, cholestin MIC is second line. Now you see the difference. The panel that I have made is all disc diffusion except for cholestin, which is an MIC because obviously disc is not recommended for cholestin. Now, I can print all second line with the result of in, result or resistant or intermediate, or I can print only the second line if the isolate is resistant to multiple first lines. So this is how we can go about. Now, what are the resistant profiles? Resistant profiles are according to their multi-resistant phenotypes and are very valuable when you want to coordinate with the infection control staff. When you want to see that, okay, is, is a particular profile dominating in ICU? And these are the profiles which are there. These, these profiles, why it is written optional is that these profiles are already there. In case you want to create a new profile, for example, in the middle of the year, you start testing for ceftazidine avibactam. So if you want to create a profile here, then maybe you can add here, edit or add. If you want to edit something that, okay, in my hospital doesn't use doxycycline, or doesn't use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole because I have only in patients or ICU patients. Or, so I can create another profile which misses out this. So that and we can add here and then, or we want to edit, we can remove this from here and then again, click okay. I might be going a little fast, but uh, I think with the constraints of times. 
so indicate which antibiotics are to be used in the profile so you can include additional antibiotic you can make them your own you know uh, so i can miss out the trimethoprim i can also add a supplementary antibiotic of vancomycin mic here i can move it up or down depending on this and then i click save so now we come down to patient locations the second button after the antibiotics now, when you enter the data manually into HUNET, what is useful is to enter a list of most common patients' locations from where you get clinical isolates. So sometimes you might have to do a little recce in some hospitals, which usually do not have uh, you know, this information already with you. That say the location is pediatrics. The code you give is say, PEDS or PEDI or PED, whatever you okay with. The institute is your name for MAMC, it be MAM. This is WHO test hospital, so it is WTH. The department again is pediatrics and the location is ICU because a pediatrics can have an ICU, it can have an inpatient, it can have an OPD. Now, this inpatient can also be your ward number at places can be A, it can be B, it can be 33, it can be 26, it can be 42, depending on your hospital. So this customization is available to you. Similarly, neonatology, if I have a neonatal ICU or I may have a neonatal OPD, both can be put. Neuro, I can do surgery, I can do derma, you can do medicine. Now note that in is inpatient, ICU is intensive care unit and outpatients is a Sometimes you may have a non-intensive care unit also. That option is also available to you when you go to location. So this is how it looks like. You can use any of the edit buttons. So uh, please do this with me so that you don't get any confusion. So if you have uh, you know, the institution, you will pick up your own institution, whatever. Like you see here, uh, sorry. Uh, you see here the NCDC or LHMC or any other, or you may not pick up any institution. So you put up the institutions list here, and then you pick up the departments. The departments drop down menu is there because these are the standard departments. It's available to you. You can put it, pick up. So you pick up ENT, you pick up, uh, you know, any of the departments say ENT, and the type of that location would become outpatients and then it also allows you to add or inpatients or ICU. Similarly, it allows you to add in the next uh, this thing as to how you are going to identify these. So you will, once you make this list, you can change it anytime. You can go to modify laboratory and the first this thing and you can change your laboratory and end. so there is an intermediate care unit an emergency whatever you feel like and you can also add your own numbers here you know the say uh, in uh, mamsi we have ward number 32 as the medicine inpatient and 33 is different than 33 too so similarly i can because the unit in charges are different and so on so i can do that also now we come to the third part that is the data field where you will see if you click on the data field you will see a default list of these data fields. So you have the country, the laboratory, which you've already written. The, now, whatever you want in your field, that should come here. So if you want to include identification number, you want to include lab number or specimen number, you may want to include the district, village or locality if you're dealing with a peripheral uh, health center or a, an associated center with it. You may want to include age and sex for simple stratified antibiograms if you want to make the age and sex stratified. You may want to include date of admission depending on whether you want to classify the antibiograms later on as hospital acquired or community acquired. And definitely location and location type. Why location is because sometimes your ICU physician may want a data specific to their ICU. Sometimes the OPD, you may desire to obtain the OPD data. So in all those situations, you may have to um, enter these in your data fields. Then the various specimen type. Specimen types are whether it is a blood sample or whether it is. Now, organism type, organism. Now here answers your question of 
the Van Gogh screen agar. You see, somebody had asked me as to where to put Van Gogh screen agar, and this is where you put the Van Gogh screen plate. This is where you put your ESBL, and this is where you put your inducible clindamycin resistance. So. So this is how it works that this is from here that you, you will include. So what do you do here is that you click on to the modify list. On the left, you see various categories of questions and suggested field. If you can't find the field, you may use a user defined field also. Now, this is a, you, there may be, there is a, you modify the list here. And remember, the data entry is you, that you're doing is human. As I said earlier, if you're receiving samples from animal and food, you can click it here. But it's better to keep it to human if you are only dealing with clinical samples. And you click isolate listing here because otherwise the option of isolate listing will not come when you do data analysis. So you can, um, for ease, you can also you know, print your list and see in, in my uh, configuration, 32 fields are there. So I can modify the list at any point of time and you can, I can also use a user defined list. Uh, I suggest you do not go changing the field length because it basically assigns a smaller length. So here we'll, we'll leave it unchanged. Now, the questions which are appearing in your data entry scheme, you can also use it to move up and move down. If you move up and move down, suppose after the specimen number, you don't want to enter the district age, you want to go jump to age, then you can move this little up so that it will come as a third, or you can move this village and district to the last one, so it will move down. So from here, you can do move up, move up and move down. And you can also, indicate which box the question appears during the data entry. For example, there is a location, there is a microbiology and there is uh, specifications which are there in the specimen. Now, uh, you can indicate that a question is hidden from the user by selecting hidden or whether to include. You can also encrypt the data when you're sharing it with the laboratories, but please create a copy first because when you encrypt the data, everything gets encrypted, the name, the age, the sex. And what happens is that the data goes to the other person and now you can't de-encrypt it. So please make a copy. If you're sharing data, make a copy for yourself and the original one you keep and the copy that you make encrypt the data so that your data is not user identifiable because sometimes there can be privacy issues, there can be breach of privacy and you can land up into lawsuits. So on the left will be the various categories of questions if you click on the modify list. See, if you click on the modify list, this is what happens. You get a lot of data categories and you get data fields. So this is what I was saying. You can create a user defined field as well. You can create your own field or you can. So if you want anything related to clinical information, it will be uh, you know, what, what disease is he suffering from? What is the reason of doing this? What is the specimen type? What is the specimen type in numeric? If you want an infection control, then this will be different. I went to microbiology, so my data fields are a little different. It talks about gram stain. It talks about organism, microscopy. Just scroll this down. You will see thousands of things which are there. You can see an OXA screen plate for those who, for you, who use OXA. So in clinical information is diagnosis is also there in the clinical information field. So if you have this, uh, if you click on the clinical information, yeah, oh no, I'm not written here. If you click on the clinical information, then this is what happens. It is not uh, giving you, but it gives you the diagnosis. It gives you the date of entry and so on and so forth. Microbiology gives you a lot of things. It gives you the organism, the organism type, the beta lactamase, the ESBL, the serotype, the antigenic things and so on and so forth. And if you add these additional fields to your code list, then also you can add. So uh, just for an exercise, let's see 
if you can put entries in description of pneumonia, urinary tract, and click OK to finish this. So if you have a diagnosis here and you click on the diagnosis, then you should be able to get the diagnosis field. This is how. You know, you code from the table below and you can make these codes. This help you to create your organism, uh, your specimen specific antibiograms and you evaluate your data as come to your specific. So all your hospital comes into Hunet. You know that is the, the person, you know the diagnosis and you know the organism isolated and so on and so forth. Now let's come down to alerts. Now alerts are about possible laboratory errors, about what should be confirmed locally or at national level. You can activate or deactivate the rules which are suggested by Hunet. You can also use a new rule. But as a novice, I suggest do not play with this because there are too many uh, alerts already. If you know, look at this, it, it basically covers the world of microbiology. So you actually do not need any uh, more alert. But even if you enter, say, an unusual organism like Burkholderia pseudomulae, it will give you an alert that it's an important species. Are you sure you've not made an error? Maybe you wanted to write Sepatia and by mistake you've written pseudomulae. Again, bacillus anthracis, especially if it is non-susceptible, it will give you an alert. Sometimes it also gives you an alert. There are certain alerts which are quality control alerts. These are all active rules. So all these rules are active rules. If you do not want to have an active rule, then you have to delete it from here. So any Acinetobacter abomina, if it is not susceptible to ampicillin, then it is probably, a, a, it says a quality control alert. For example, if you enter cholestin for staph, if you don't have a panel and you enter, it will tell you something has gone wrong. It will give you a pop-up that it's a quality control alert. If the... Uh, if it feels that if you are entering the in Hunet, you should make it a point to enter your QC data as well. If you're using a weekly QC or a monthly QC, you should enter all the data of ATCC isolates here. And it immediately tells you that your performance of the lab is how good or how bad over the past six months. So if, if you have something where susceptibility isolates, we know are very uncommon, then it will give you a alert here. So now um, you've configured everything. You have finished your lab configurations. So you click on the save. So you've configured the antibiotics, you've configured the data fields, and you've configured the locations according to your uh, hospital. So uh, even if you've, you were able to create, say, one or two data fields or one or two antibiotics right now, it's okay. At any point of time, you can go and modify your laboratory. So just for an exercise, uh, I thought that you can create one laboratory and the laboratory will now be named as the lab, which is there with your code number, which you gave and with the country. So all these fields are done now. So what you do is that you click on to save. Once you click on to the save, it will save your laboratory. So. At any time you want to make changes, you can go and make changes to the laboratory and click on to modify laboratory. So remember the first slide that we saw, which we opened, yes, this one. So in this, you can see there is a new laboratory. This is an open laboratory and this is modify laboratory. And there is copy laboratory field also. Sometimes you may, want to take this laboratory home to your PC. You may want to take the home, you may, from your laptop, suppose you want to shift to another PC, or maybe your PC has lived its life and has been replaced by your institution. You might not want to part away with the old data, or you don't want to create another laboratory and go through this whole exercise and then get stuck and then call uh, me or Sheila or Isabella, that's for troubleshooting. A very simple thing you do is you copy the laboratory from here. Once you copy the laboratory in your pen drive or anything, when you download Hunet there, open the Hunet folder and paste this laboratory. Everything will come there on its own. And the newer version is very good. If you're, you download the newer version, it automatically picks up your laboratory. You don't have to 
paste it. Only when your instrument changes, the hardware changes, you copy and take it there. Then at any point of time, you can modify the laboratory. And when you have to do data entry, you simply press open laboratory and it opens whatever you've configured till now. So did this, we come down to the end of configuration of laboratory. So if there are any questions uh, for this, I will take them right now. Omega, this presentation will be shared. We're recording it exactly for that reason. And that's again one advantage which COVID gave us that we record and we share so that you can keep practicing with the presentation. And Dr. Sonal, you're doing a great job. I'm sure everybody is enjoying it. And I uh, just hope everybody is on I, I just hope everybody is on track and is not uh, law getting lost somewhere. <laughs> Uh, I don't think so. However, we have the recording and then we can always work with that. But uh, the way you're doing it, it looks very easy and uh, doable and gives us the right QCs and gives us the right prompts so that if we go astray, it'll nudge us back into the right direction. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It's, if, you, if you're good in Excel, you'll be good in Runet. Excel is it's, it's built on that access and Excel platform only. So... Uh, and it does exactly usually the same kind of formulas and similar kind of work that it does uh, when it takes. Any comments from Dr. Sheila or Isabella? Uh, no, I, it, was, it was a real good presentation. You could follow. I mean, I, I hope everybody could follow it. I was just thinking like a homework, you know, anyway, they all have downloaded. They can actually, today they can try so that tomorrow if they have any problem, then they can ask you, you know, then we can further interact and try to sort out. The, right, uh, right, right, right. Work only, you will get to know all the problems. Yes, yeah. because um, sometimes they may not be able to pick up certain fields. Sometimes yes. what the problems after conducting so many UNET workshops, I feel most of the places people get stuck is in their data fields or sometimes the location part also. Mm -hmm. So uh, if tomorrow my PC decides to cooperate with me, then I will uh, be able to show the real uh, laboratory configuration, how to create in, in a recap of say five, 10 minutes in the beginning. And um, I think we can all WhatsApp to Meher if we have any of these questions related to this presentation or share it in the chat box till we are all around. So that yes. should not, uh, you know, create uh, any more confusion. So, Mayor, do we have time to start with the data entry part? I don't think so. I mean, uh, it'd be good if we practice this, as Dr. Shizar was saying, and come back tomorrow so that whatever bottlenecks we face, we clear that and then move. What is the opinion of the house? Anybody who would like to start today? Actually, I have Dr. Uh, Dr. 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 Would you like to ask something? Any clarification? Yeah, somebody was speaking, I think. Yeah. yeah. Me, Actually, I have a software in the laptop. If you want me to uh, show that, I can help you out. No, what will happen is that then the PPT will have to go. I'm thinking if we should cover data entry right now or not. How that much is... time will you take for that? Another 10, 15 minutes only. What I was thinking was we can cover data entry, then we stick to the schedule that we have for today. And tomorrow we can go to analysis, troubleshooting and user experience. Yes, yes. I think that's very good. If it's uh -huh. 10, 15 minutes, then we have time. Uh -huh. Tomorrow, um, Isabella, you will have to take over for the troubleshooting and uh, common issues uh, part because uh, I'll have, I have another activity scheduled for the World Antibiotic Awareness Week at uh, two and this happened courtesy the confusion me and me and Meher created in the Oman time and India time. So the first um, case, the first was very clear <laughs> and then we got that because I shared I think, ha, then, ha, yeah. so that, that that's okay. No issues with that. The only thing was that I had something scheduled at one o'clock which I shifted to two. So I can't okay. uh, change it again. So what I will do is that uh, I will leave it around one. And Isabella can take over and uh, sure. we can sure. discuss the troubleshooting and the user experience part. 
So uh, what we can do is I can start with the data entry right now and uh, take you to uh, data this thing. So that tomorrow morning, we first resolve any issues that have come up during this, you know, uh, as uh, Dr. Sheila suggested, maybe as an exercise, we all create one test laboratory for our this thing. And we also go ahead. Another interesting thing that I would like to tell you all is that when you open the Hoonet by double clicking it, uh, you at one particular corner, just a second. Uh, yeah. So uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. So here you see help. Now, if you click on to this help, you will see a lot of, uh, you know, somebody has been asking me the presentations. So these are all these, all this material is actually available there. It, in the form of PDFs, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. What I have done is that I have made a PPT out of it and added my own pictures while doing the uh, entry. And this is, uh, this is the only thing which is different. So every time you have a teacher built in your Hoonet to teach you everything. And these tutorials and these uh, PPTs are all made from those tutorials which are there in your help section. So how do we create a new data file? So first thing is that uh, you launch Hoonet and uh, for creating a data file, open your WHO tutorial hospital because it has been created in such a manner so as to teach you how to do data entry and how to do data analysis. So you will see... Uh, on top of the screen, you will see a data entry menu. And this data entry menu will show you a few things. It will tell you new data file. It will tell you to open a data file. And there are a few more things which I want to uh, just bring it to your notice right now. Suppose you want to update WhoNet for a DOS data file, you can do it. You want to encrypt patient information, you can do that. If you want to combine or export data files, that also you can do. You can combine various data files. If you want to modify a clinical report, which you've sent out, if you're using WhoNet for dispatching the reports, that also you can do. If you want to modify the data file structure, that also you can do right now. So uh, we create a, we have to create a new data file. Now, how do you create a new data file? Now, every file on a computer will name a location. Now the name by default, the location of all the WhoNet files is in the C drive. Everything related to Hoonet, the moment you download goes to the C drive. Remember that. And there you find a small folder which says Hoonet in capital, something like this. So everything is there on that. And whatever data you create goes in a subfolder in that Hoonet folder, which is labeled as data. So whatever you create will in your data file will go to the data. And whatever you create as a file will go as a lab will go in your Hoonet folder. So for the file name, Hoonet, Hoonet will suggest you a name. So you can put in a year, say this is 19 year, you can create your own lab code and then the country code. So example, this is W29WHO. So the if you want to create a file for 2008, then you will need uh, this file. Suppose you want to enter the September data in this, then you can create a data file. It will ask you its name and you can create that file. So uh, if you go, this is, this is uh, what it shows here. The drives are in C drives and you can create a, give a name to a new data file. This feature has probably changed in the newer version. So you may see it in a different manner. It may not be available like this. This is one at five. So this is slightly different from the other, but it's not, uh, the basics would remain the same. So if you have a Hoonet files in you, so for example, this is January 2018 at Lady Harding Medical College, which was my workplace earlier. So you have 202 2018 LHM. This is how IND is for India. So uh, if I'm creating another file, say for October in 2018, I give it a name of W1018 IND. Um, as, a, as a seasoned user, I like to give a new name for each month because once it happened with me that my data crashed in September and I lost eight, nine months of data. So after that, after that, I always create monthly files and I upload them either on my email or cloud or I take it in my, uh, you know, uh, my uh, portable hard drive so that 
this is not a problem and i don't lose more than a month's data so now once you created that file the hunet will directly proceed you to data entry and you can now enter this these fields so uh, we will not do this exercise right now this is how the screen would look like so if i tell you to enter uh, this is the particular name 12345 is the hospital identification number name of the patient age date of admission is year diagnosis is pneumonia he is admitted in medical ward 2 and uh, the specimen number is this the specimen number is your lab number this is the date this is the type of a specimen that is blood the organism is this these are the zone diameters that i have so if you have a manual system before beginning the hunet entry try to first make a register in your lab which collects this data on an easily transcribable platform but if you have a hunet uh, ytech or something else then it's a different story but if you have a manual this thing you will like to create a first a manual register where all these zone sizes are noted otherwise your de or your lab tech or your resident doctor will is going to have a lot of problem so what you do here is you put an identification number the age the uh, everything you fill in the specimen the specimen type the collection date the organism the moment you put an sau it will automatically tell you are you talking about staph or yes so it will bring it out so after a while you tend to remember these short names and instead of typing the whole staff you try to put in the short words but in the beginning you might have to uh, you know so the moment it picks up it is staff warriors it will show you the panel of staff warriors only and this is one of the problems that is usually encountered by people that they say that i can't see any more antibiotic here and i want to add mic results for vancomycin so if you shift from disk to mic it will take you to the mic panel also which you made right at the beginning of that the configuration that is why i said entry should be completed with configuration then if if you want sometimes what you may feel is that you 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 want to add more antibiotics which you are not mentioned in your panel then you can if you drop down this at one point of time you will see all bacteria so for that you can use if you don't want to use this panel that is also possible the patient type is an adult type here you can put in the institution if it is different from your institution and if you want to put in any comment that do not dispatch this report dispatch this report to infection control nurse now what has happened here is the moment you've done these entries it says it's a medium priority alert which is an mrsa so it's an infection control alert and microbiologist the, the on the report it will give you that the resistant isolates are to be tracked so what it does it that if you click on this it will ask you when you want to then you want to click on the save isolate here at the top so if you click on the save isolate what it will tell you you want to save the isolate okay you want to save the isolate and continue with the same specimen sometimes the same specimen will give you two isolates so if you click on this what happens is that the basic fundamental you know things of this part 1 we actually divide this data entry into three parts the basic entry of the laboratory the microbiology aspect of it and in additional feature so the basic part will come automatically fed in and you just have to change the organism here and the sensitivity is here so if you click on the save the isolate and continue with the same specimen it will allow you to enter the second isolate with the from the same specimen you may want to save the isolate and continue with the same patient say the patient ka one uh, the csf has been sent and a blood has been sent now if that is a sick story then you don't want to retype the whole information again what you can do is you click on the save the isolate and continue with the same patient and what it will do is that it will um, it will only change the specimen type will become empty the rest of the things will remain the same maybe the collection date if you want to change you can do that and uh, another thing i must tell you here is that the uh, majority of the computers uh, are built in in such a manner that they pick up the american system of date that means the month first and the date later in india we have the habit of putting the date first and the month later now this sometimes creates huge issues when you are dealing with 12 till 12 date because what happens is you put in 12 november and it puts it as november 12 uh, 
So be very careful when you're putting in these data. Now here again, it's giving you an alert that it's an important resistant and it's an infection control alert. So you might want to send this to your infection control team and ask them to follow it up uh, at their end. So you click OK accordingly what you're doing, save whether you want to save it or you want this. Now, the, this, this is the issue that I was talking about, that if you type 10, 12, 18 on your computer, the WHONET will probably make it 10 December. That is what it reads it. On the other hand, if you're in the United States, the WHONET will interpret it as 12 October. So please remember to either check on the date when you're putting in the data or on your computer, change it to the system that you're more familiar with and that is followed in your country. So now the data entry, if you're entering the quantitative measurement or you're entering the test interpretations, there are two ways of doing it. It is recommended that you enter the the zone diameters or the MIC values rather than eyeballing just the result. Because what happens is that interpretive breakpoints change. Remember ciprofloxacin in 2010 changed. So later on, if you want to see that with the previous, how much would we have got and how much are we getting now? Or suppose you want to review the distribution of histogram, you cannot do that. Because whatever you put in as sensitive will remain as sensitive. What you put in as resistance will remain as resistance. But if you put in your zone diameters and MIC, after a time, you can review these test measurements and you can learn a lot by mechanism of resistance and epidemiologies of resistant zones. And all of us have got a, a sleeping researcher inside our uh, bodies. So let the researcher be awake when you have such a huge data available. Now, if I were to enter for the same patient, one more bacterial isolate from the same blood specimen. Remember, I entered one MRSA and now this poor fellow has got E. coli also which is extremely drug resistant and is showing me carbapenem non-susceptibility. So the moment I say save, it will say enterobacteria C, which is carbapenem non-susceptible. Are you okay with it? Confirm that it's not a laboratory. And sometimes instead of putting 22, the DEO has put in 12. So it gives them opportunity to see, okay, let me see in the register, it's, it's 12 or 22. So uh, this is a way of validating your own uh, because it's a, it's a very short workshop, we are not I'm, we are not covering validation, but this is how one way the system automatically validates the data. So it says, okay, this is this is how I entered E. coli. It's a gram-negative panel, and I find that it is uh, it tells me it's non-susceptible. You still want this is a high priority alert. So um, with the coming up of the multi-drug resistant isolates, it actually becomes a it should be now downgraded to low priority because majority of the isolates are like that. So uh, you want to save the isolate, then it tells you that it's not only you want to save the isolate because it's an ESBL producing enterobacteria C, which is resistant to most of the drugs, but it's also you might like to send it to a reference laboratory. Specifically with cholestein, vancomycin, these becomes very, very important that you want them to be confirmed from something. So now this time, because you entered both the isolates, both the with the same specimen, you now click on save the isolates. Now the third entry, the same patient, uh, the another patient, if there is another entry, this is how, uh, if, if you want to do it, you can do it in the WTH. And we'll take a few minutes break if you want to do it. Meanwhile, the others can put in any query if they like in the chat box, but uh, you can on a very important point here yeah, that we should make a point of entering either the zone sizes or the MICs. They are so very important yes. from one perspective of understanding what is the trend and be sure that we actually interpret it according to the changes in CLSI or UCAS breakpoint. Another very important thing from antimicrobial stewardship angle is that we can recommend, depending on the MIC, you know, there may be three or four antibiotics that are sensitive. But we could absolutely recommend to our clinical friends, which is the one you would, we would uh, want them to use, the one with the lower MIC, because then the PKPD for that particular antibiotic works better because the Cmax over the MIC, we get a much better uh, concentration of antibiotics. So I feel really that we need senior doctors sitting on the workbenches and we want them to do quality assurance and check out the zone sizes, all the MICs, and make sure that they are uh, they are actually entered rather than just sensitive and resistant and of course intermediate. Very very important point. Another right. point that I would like to highlight here is the minute you get an alert, 
like you know there's a cre or maybe a police the first thing which needs to be done is communicate to the clinician to find out is it really uh, the bug sitting in the inside the patient or is the problem with the connection because that does happen and it's very important to communicate so that when you putting in that entry and you're getting a data which is going to be relevant for a long time is that bacteria really causing septicemia or not so senior doctors need to communicate with the colleagues the senior colleagues to make sure that the specimen has sanctity and it should be collected in the right way so that when we get very hyper about the whole thing it really means something and we need to work on that from the clinical from the pre analytic diagnostic aspect very correct mayor actually uh, this is how you work you know you you take it forward actually from here uh, i i always say this in my hunet workshops that i have conducted across uh, three countries now and many places in india i always feel that it is you know you are the foot soldiers the way and the data is in your hands now so now you can analyze it you can convince your clinicians that see uh, i i have found out that many of the tertiary care centers continue to use uh, Uh, linezolids and vancomycin for patients with whom you have already given a very good sensitivity profile it's an msa and they continue to use that so i feel that in those cases at least one can you know uh, it, it becomes very important if you have the data to convince the clinicians yes and of course ultimately sonal uh, as uh, recommending restricted formulary with hunet in place and we following the guidelines i think time for microbiologists to implement it yes if you have a restricted reporting you will definitely restrict your prescription formulary yes. sometimes the clinicians do get uh, sometimes the clinicians do get you know riled up saying that you've not given a sensitivity but then you have to talk to them and convince them that your first line is working why do you want to give a second line yes yes And especially, you know, they are being uh, they are being trained by the medical reps who so coming up with the newest antimicrobial and saying that you know this is the make it and break it, and we are not there to tell them the real picture. So that's what's happening. They're driving the resistance by using the higher end drug because they feel satisfied that you know clinical outcome is going to be good. But that's not necessarily yeah. the case. So we need to be there with them, and that's in this particular study which we're doing. we're going to be meeting a clinician in the seminar room in their seminar room so we're going to be there in the lion den so to say and communicating with them so many resistant profiles that they don't have a clue because microbiology is growing in its own terribly fast pace and they're doing their bit so we need to communicate with them in their areas develop consensus and make sure that they do their bit in nice. uh rational antimicrobial usage and saving it it has to be a very good team effort which i think is what we're going to start with of course this great workshop which you've done and uh, the very good uh, uh, hand hand holding which have been done through this workshop any questions please now this is what the i was talking about to enter your qc results always remember to end your enter your qc results so that your qc is there in the one place only so um, uh, you can enter here as a qc in the specimen type you can put in as qc and it will tell you that there is it is unacceptable as a qc result and it is out of qc range so you might want to repeat this but it gets documented especially for all the labs which are accredited or going for accreditation this might be very very useful that you put in a um, put your reports here and if they want you you can always take out a qc uh, report and give it to them that yes we have been doing it every week or every day or uh, every month now uh, once you've done that you can click on the exit and you come down to the menu so once you've saved the isolate you will come down somebody is asked that they are not seeing the data file entry so this is where you do you open the data file where you want to enter and then maybe you will get it uh, someone is not getting it i don't know what's uh, wrong so just uh, just look at here it should be it has a file it has a data entry if you have not created a um, a lab then go to this file and open the who test hospital maybe that is why you are not seeing data entry because you have not created a file as yet in a fresh one you may not see 
so you have to first open uh, you know your lab so now uh, you can use the open data file option and uh, one thing you can do is that uh, since we don't have time for this hands on entry uh, one another interesting that i uh, thing that you uh, must remember is that when you are working on this you have a view database option so at the end of the day please ask your deo or your lt or your uh, resident whosoever is doing this entry to view this database now this if you click on this view database it shows you a table where all your fields come data fields come all your antibiotics come and all the organism come it's very easy to monitor for one day 50 60 70 80 isolates but if you allow this to collect over a period of time and you think that only once a day i will check this that day will never come so before uh, leaving your workplace make it a habit to view this database that gives you an idea as to what all we isolated today what is the picture that we have and what is the what if if any mistake has been done it can be rectified then and there so that's another way of validating your uh, data which is uh, gone inside your computer so um, with this i think i'll stop share and uh, any questions i can take and uh, dr sheela and isabella can also assist see i i thought that question which uh, somebody had posted on the this one data entry icon is not there i think the first page when you open launch the that only will have the only file and the help icons you just go to the open laboratory after you have set it up open laboratory you have all the icons ah, that's entry. what i said they have not opened the laboratory that is why it is not yes. showing any questions please you can feel free to ask and if you have a good time please feel free to tell us that as well and can we can we have everybody's camera on so that we can uh, meher can then click a photo and uh, give our contribution to world antibiotic awareness week yeah that's great yes, it just happened fortuitously but i'm very happy about it yeah so we must uh, put it on all the Uh, I think uh, Dr. Meher, maybe gallery view. You can put and take a uh, screenshots. Gallery view and take a uh, screenshots. So okay, you can get everything. Okay, I think as well. Yeah, I might as well take it with all the names because there's so many uh, people who haven't really are not yes. using the cameras. everybody can do their own uh, screenshot please feel free to take a screenshot on your own computer as well we can see dr balvinder here good welcome dr ashish dr vasudha there so many uh, and such a pleasure dr maria how are you good to see you dr shaika from jammu and kashmir dr maria from peshawar and so many others uh, dr sarita dr archana dr anand it's a pleasure to have you all Dr. Turkia, would you like to say something? Dr. Turkia, the consultant microbiologist in our own hospital here. So I'd start taking photos. I mean, of whatever I have. So a very happy. I mean, happy. I hope we happy World Antibiotic Awareness Week, and I hope we spread the word and we try to restrict. I mean, what is the word? The word is. Uh, caution and microbiologists know it but our job is to now communicate really strongly with with our clinical friends so there is no escape we need to leave our labs and we need to be there as clinical microbiologists right with them giving advice on the phone is very good but being there face to face so that they develop trust in us and we develop trust in them because currently if you know i don't know if you really feel it but there are a lot of finger pointing happening they did this and they are doing that And still, we keep doing the day, the othering. We are not going to achieve substantial success. So we need to understand their issues, and they need to understand our limitations. And together, we can uh, bring about a change in the work environment, change in work ethics, and more responsible prescribing.
So, Dr. Sheena, I can see you here. There comes the photograph. Dr. Anil, we'd like to see you. We'd love to see all of you. Please open your cameras. We see you. We take a photograph and then we can upload it as uh, Dr. Sonal said, wherever. Hiba, Aisha, Shaika, Safir, Sarita, Vasudha, Leila, Sangeeta, so many. I can see Dr. Anirima here. So anyways, there we go. Any comments and uh, please carry on with the good work. Uh, one comment which I would like to say that with Hune, the responsibility of correct diagnostic stewardship becomes even stronger because this is going to become our hallmark. This is going to be a kind of our identification that this particular institution has this amount of resistance. Is that real resistance or is that not so real? That's our responsibility to make sure it is. And of course, our job is to re-engineer ourselves, know more about PKPD and communicate very effectively with our clinical friends and assist them in appropriate antimicrobial test timing. So is that all? Do we hear from somebody? Isabella? From the private sector. Isabella is from the private sector. It'll be good to hear from her as well, uh, what her insights are. Of course, she has an LIS. So uh, basically, we are still with the manual entry only. We don't okay. the LIS with the uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, for some, for those of them who are thinking that I have all my data on an Excel sheet, uh, what okay. do I do with it? You can all cover it in that way. That will be the, I think that will be the condition of most of the hospitals, which I was also uh, doing previously, before I started direct uh, entry. So that will be easily addressed. So if you have a, Excel sheet where you have a lot of data, you can always export it to the moment and analyze it. That is the easiest way to go about it. Uh, that will be my hands on session now the last day. Uh, so that is the common uh, query which everybody will have. Uh, what do we do if I have already a lot of data? Okay. This thing. And also, if you're using a Vitek, most centers are using Vitek, we can easily convert uh, the data which is there for Vitek into the readable format of the unit and uh, analyze. So uh, these are the common uh, things that uh, we'll be addressing. Troubleshooting, of course, uh, tomorrow, I think, uh, ma'am has, uh, you know. Uh, yes, tomorrow, data analysis should tomorrow, not take. Think, uh, by the time. Yeah, data so analysis will not take uh, much. audience have any uh, queries and data entry or tomorrow I can uh, address that. Yes. Perfect. Dr. Balvinder Mohan from PGI Chandigarh, would you like to say something? Tell us uh, your experience. Hey, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Mahir. It's a uh, uh, good learning experience. I'm very well quite a bit. But I have learned previously also uh, about Hune. But we don't practice it regularly. And uh, for us, I think it's a good learning experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonam. Nice listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So shall we call it a day now? And we meet tomorrow, inshallah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. 12 only, no? Thank you. Yes, yes. 12 from India, 10.30 from Oman, and 11.30 from Pakistan. So absolutely splendid beginning to who net. I think we are all stronger and shall become uh, more accountable in our daily work. So thank you so much, Dr. Sonal, Dr. Sheila, Dr. Isabella, and all the participants for being here and being so very uh, interactive and so involved in the process of learning more. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Take care. Bye. I need to thank Dr. Ken Master, who is one of our uh, leads, but he is busy today. He will be with you tomorrow. He is a medical education informatics department uh, associate professor there. Thank you. Then see you all tomorrow. Bye bye.
Bye bye. Dr. Sheetal, good to see you here. Dr. Priya, so many of our old friends and it's lovely seeing you all. Bye bye. Dr. Sujita, where are you from? Sujita is gone now, I think. It's time to call it a day.